Okay, it's 11 o'clock, so we're gonna get started. So welcome to this, what I think is a really fantastic session. Just press my clicker the wrong direction. This is Net uh, DevOps Configuration Management for the network. Uh, my name is Stuart Clark. I work for Cisco DevNet as a network automation advocate. Um, for those of you who want to know what that means, it doesn't mean that I'm gonna try to convince you that YAML's a programming language or come and bang on your door with a leaflet at 7 a.m. on a Sunday morning and then hightail it down your path. But what it does mean is we're gonna talk uh, about um, net, net, uh, network configuration management and how you can achieve this within your network, whether you're building this from ground zero or whether you're in the industry already or whether you're looking to simplify your uh, automation or just get it better at it. So our agenda for today is what is um, infrastructure uh, code as management? The benefits of configuration management because there has to be a benefit or we wouldn't do it. The recipes, the manifest, the playbooks and all of the tools that we're now exposed to as engineers and also then finishing with a configuration management where using Ansible as our, as our finale piece. So what is infrastructure and configuration management? Infrastructure as code is storing your files as computer data, uh, machine readable data and definition files. I put the little Wikipedia thing up there if you want to check that out afterwards and have a good comprehensive read about it. I always like to put the defini definition in there so people can take a look and see what it's all about. But more simply, some of the principles of networkers code is that nowadays we're storing our running configurations, not as running configurations anymore. Gone are the days of having them on like a shared server or something like that, or maybe in Rancid or SVN if you used SVN back in the day. But we're keeping it now as machine readable data. So this is formats such as YAML or JSON perhaps, or, or even XML. And there isn't one right language to keep them out. Some people ask me, what is the best language to keep them out? Your mileage may vary. You may prefer JSON. This guy down here might prefer uh, YAML. And the guy at the back there might, you know, might be really into his XML and he'll store his XML files. But what we're going to do is by having this um, machine readable files stored, we're going to store them in a source and we're going to keep that as our source of truth. And we're going to keep it as a source of truth for not only for our production, but our, our, our test environments. And we're going to treat them as one as the same. So if you're lucky enough to have a POC or a a test bed where you're testing things in a CRD, CRCD framework, you're going to keep those exactly the same. You might test them in one area, make sure they work, and then push them out to your production area to make sure they work there in, in the production area when there's actual traffic and customers there. And we're going to deploy those using APIs. And we're still going to do that from the source, from the original part of truth, but we're going to push them out to our network devices using APIs. And this will limit um, manual network configurations. I don't know about you, but when I was configuring networks, I always had everything in text files. And I would copy everything down there, control A, get into the device, and just copy it straight in there. And just paste the entire thing in there. And just watch it run in there all the time. And it's labor intensive, and you have to kind of just sit there, just glued to your monitor, hoping that you're not going to get any errors, and you've got your spaces right, you've got absolutely everything nailed down perfectly. So we're going to explore the configuration management tooling which allows us to do this. And the configuration management is the mechanism and the characteristics of a system. And for me, mechanism equals automation, which means there's none of this hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat that I was speaking about before of copying and pasting in all these multiple devices. I used to really think a number of years ago that I was actually the king of the CLI. I didn't actually call myself the king of the CLI because that would be silly. But I was really quick with the CLI. I could rattle through codes and I could have half a dozen terminals up and I could jump to the terminals really, really quickly. But as my network grew, there's only a certain amount of terminals I can have on my window. And there's only a certain amount that I should really do and control at the same time because I'm a big believer in that multitasking is wrong. So configuration management today is all about the tools and these tools help make our lives so much more simpler. And if you're pushing something out at scale, for example, the last, de the last network I worked on was 40 sites, I wanted consistency across every single one of my sites. 
And consistency plus scale equals success. And if you can achieve that, then you're in a really great place. What I look for on my system is the characteristics and the desired state. And the desired state for me is making sure that I have all of the software correctly installed across all of my devices. I want all of my XE devices running on the same uh, images. I want all of my XR devices running on the same images. And there's many times across, the, uh, across when you're working with multiple teams that you're in the middle of an upgrade or something like that, and you want to know which devices are running which. If you've got 200 devices in you in the middle of an upgrade uh, process, you might be doing some in APAC and some in Europe and then some, say for example, in, in the US. And you want to keep track of those because often you'll get the tap on the shoulder that says, are we running this device? And you want to know what state those are in. And we want to look at the attributes like the names and addresses and the ownership as well. When you're running anything at scale, you've got multiple IP addresses and multiple names, DNS things, and they all have to be in the right order for anything to really function. And when that starts to slip and when you start to get configuration drift, these things start to get out of, out, out of state. And we need to control those better. And then we have features, uh, feature specific configurations as well. So I'm talking about VPC, HSRP, OSPF, you know, all of these things that we're really familiar with and worked with for a number of years. They all perform certain features across our network, right? So we need to make sure that all those feature specific configurations match what we want out there on the network. Oops, jumped ahead, sorry. There we go. So we have our as is state our desired state and our benchmark state. And these equal for me the benefits of configuration management. When I worked with my last data center team, we would send the data center team to a, um, a remote site. And there'd only be two or three guys out there. And often the stuff would land and it'd only get a maximum time at the actual data center site. And this might seem familiar to all of you if you've used like remote hands or you've had your own data center team who actually go out to these sites and perform this. And while these guys are on site, you're either paying them by the hour or you're paying a lot of money to get people out there to do this. And there was a great example for me where we were building a new data center in Secaucus. Our data center team flew out there on the Sunday. All the stuff had been shipped out there for them but 50% of the hardware was being held in customs. Unfortunately, this was the edge devices connecting to the providers and also the core devices, which meant we couldn't build anything without those there because we couldn't get network connectivity in our data center. So the guys that had five days to essentially build 10 racks, by the time the stuff had cleared customs, they had two days two days to build an entire data center out, or 10 racks out. They had to rack it, stack it, get the baseline configuration in there. And then, as I mentioned at the start, I had to go in there and put all the configurations onto this. And then I had to pass this over to the QA team, who had to validate this. And the QA team would often come back to me and say, something's not passing the QA test. So I then had to go back and look at the files to see what was wrong. And after the QA guys have done their job, they pass it into the other teams that we know, like MonOps and DevOps and all the other teams that we work with, and they test their stuff. So I want the ability to be able to simplify and build an entire data center through automation. And that might seem like a big ask, but it really, really is possible. So no more, no. I don't need those guys on the site for five days anymore. And I can cut back there. And that makes my boss super pleased because he's not paying a huge volume of money to keep those guys on site. And it means the data center guys can go out and enjoy the splendors of the city. And this is my favorite slide amongst all of these. No more snowflakes. Um, who here has done on call? Yeah, you can see because as soon as I mention on call, you kind of get a little tense. It's two in the morning. My on call phone goes, and I'm the on call engineer yet again. And it's, it seems to be always you. Oh, it seems like it's always you that gets the calls. And you wake up, and you've got another, another team who's trying to deploy something, and something's not working, or something's broken, 
and has flagged an alarm with the tier one team or the tier two team, or even worse, a customer's called in and they said something isn't working. And so you get out of bed, you wipe the sleep from your eyes, you're having a beautiful dream about exiting Vim cleanly, and you walk across into your office, your kitchen, your living room after you've fallen over the poor dog who's just laid there in a, in a sleep as well. Open your laptop up and you put in a magic fix. And I use the term magic fix because if any of you have taken the CCIE, you know you're not allowed to put these magic fixes in to actually get the desired result, like a static route or something like that. So you put the magic fix in because really you want to put the fix in and you want to go back to bed. So you put the fix in, you confirm it's working, and you go back to bed. You wake up the next day, get a cup of coffee and you're on your way to the office and you forget about that little thing that you put in there last night, that snowflake. And it wasn't ideal for your templates, it wasn't ideal for your winning configuration because you needed it to work then. But events happen. You go into work and there's maybe an outage, you maybe get pulled into a meeting and you leave that single line in there, that single snowflake in your network, on your device. And then the day goes by and the day after that goes by and then a week goes by and then you're doing an audit on your network and you're scratching your head thinking, why did I put that in there? And you can't remove it now because it might affect a customer outage, it might have another effect for another team. So you have to remember when it's actually in there. And so by moving into the source control that we're talking about and the automated view of having everything within the templates and the source control as our single source of truth, we can eliminate those snowflakes because every time we make a change, we go back to that original source control to make those changes. And we've talked about source control quite heavily, but what I meant when we was putting those lines in there is then that moves us into version control. And version control is like the big brother of source control, as I like to think about it. And it gives you that ability to look back historically of the changes that you've made through your source control to actually see when changes were made. I've made changes across a network for a different team and I might have just done something simple like a, an access list or a prefix list or I might have increased prefixes on a BGP peering. But in, by making that change, I might have broke something else. If I change a mask on a access list or something like that, or I update some ports, it might stop another team's access from working. But they don't notice that straight away. It's not mission critical. And I had this a number of times with our database team who would say, we're looking at the graphs and we've got this chunk of data missing and it's missing from the 15th of January. Can you tell me what change took place on the 15th of January? So I can go back to my version control in my source control and I can look and I can see that change and I can see that subnet mass that was changed which cut off his access to his database. So that gives us the ability to historically look back at our winning configurations quite easily and see the change that took place. Probably back in the old day, I would have had Rancid or something like that running and I would have done a diff on the two Rancids. But then I, you know, I'm kind of really relying on the database team giving me the accurate information of when that actually stopped working. And if a number of changes had taken place within that day, I might have to go through five or six or seven changes or snapshots of that device to actually see when it happened. So it makes it a little bit easier when we're looking back on previous versions to see when something changed and stopped working. I started messing around with tools probably about three years ago. And I say messing around because I was messing around. I wanted to own the tools. I wanted to have the monitoring under my, under my control. I wanted to have the source control. I wanted to own all of these things. So I started looking to them more deeply and it wasn't something that traditionally network engineers really did and that was where I came from. We didn't actually own tools. We asked the SRE team to build something for us. But then we started to look into the ownership of these tools and this can be anything from monitoring tools and again to automation tools, what this is really all about. And I wanted to own every part of those because I don't like the dependency on other teams owning something 
Because again, if you're doing something in the middle of the night, you're having to disrupt another team and you're adding that time lag on there to get something fixed. Some of the commonalities of configuration management tools, and you'll be familiar with Ansible, Puppet, and Chef, and SaltStack, kind of really started in the server domain. But now they're sort of coming into the network domain, and we're using more and more of these as network engineers. Certainly, Ansible is the key favorite there, but Puppet's coming on great gains, and SaltStack combined with tools like uh, Napalm or something is commonly quite used today. There's some really great books written about uh, network, common, uh, network automation using these tools. And the thing that they have in common besides that, you know, they all started, you know, with configurations in the server area was they're all open source foundation, which means you can contribute to them. I like this idea of being able to go into GitHub and being able to put a pull on um, Ansible's repo or on Puppet's repo and say, I've come across this issue. Is it something I found or is this a general issue? And you're helping the community out there. All of these four tools provide us with both automation and orchestration. So we've got a double win. And they all have idempotent behavior. And if you've ever been in an Ansible workshop session before, you do have to mention idempotent. I think it's the law. But what they give us is facts, lots and lots of facts, lots of facts about our network, everything that from desired state to the configuration, to um, CPU, to memory, to everything that we need to know about our network to save us logging back in again. And we can do this using modules and libraries. So here's a quick kind of shoot down of all of the different things that we're looking at and how they kind of differ with all the tools. And you can see that we have this sort of like traditionally agent-based and then we have agent-less. SaltStack is written in Python, for those of you that really like Python, and you can add it with Python. I mentioned Napalm before, which I think is a really nice combination to use with um, SaltStack. And it uses agent space, known as minions. And everything is then synced into the Salt Master. We have Chef, which is written in Ruby. I'm not too au fait with Ruby. I really never got into the sort of whole Ruby thing. Um, but the Chef provides us with recipes and, again, manifests and cookbooks. And then we have Puppet, which is again um, Ruby based, but it's traditionally agent based. Um, I did change this slide recently because if when I did this presentation uh, before, it's going to move now into agentless. Well, I'm going to let you into a little secret just because there's only friends here. But on DevNet Learning Labs, we are going to be launching the um, agentless puppet configuration. So you can um, configure Cisco devices using agentless puppet. And we should have that on the DevNet site and the DevNet Learning Lab within the next month. And then we go to my favorite, which is Ansible, which the back end is written in Python, but yet the front end is written in YAML. So you don't have to be a Python engineer to understand Ansible, which is really great. And if you're just starting out in your automation and your journey, Ansible is a really nice way to get started because YAML is really easy to pick up and learn. And this is agentless and be controlled by any computer. But I have put a little optional in there because they actually do offer the commercial version, which is called Ansible Tower. And what you create is the playbooks and the roles. So why would I use Ansible for the network? Well, I mentioned it was agentless, which means I can run it on my own machine. You can run it on your machine. You can run it on your machine. And you can run it on your machine, which is fantastic. And it's really popular within the network community, i.e. there's lots of examples and there's lots of modules. So most of the heavy lifting has already been done for you. And if you do get stuck, you can pop into things like the Network to Code Slack channel. And there's loads of different resources. We're all familiar with Stack Overflow. You can pop into there and you can answer the question. And there's tons of experts out there in the community who are able to help you quite quickly. We mentioned it was written in Python. And where does this tie in? Well, eventually, if you start to get better with Ansible, you might want to sort of start creating bits and pieces yourself. And then you can start exploring that with Python. You can start creating some more creative things like modules and things and your own custom modules. And you can go into the Python part and create that for yourself. And again, you can submit that back to the community because there's probably other people who are trying to figure out the same thing as well. And it's simple to install and get started.
which is another bonus, right? Clicker. Okay. So we've talked about it quite extensively, but really now what I want to do is I want to show you this stuff. But before I get to showing you, I want to just give you a quick overview of how Ansible works. And we talked about this running locally, and I mentioned that you're running it on your machine, and you're on your machine. You're still okay to work with us and run it on your machine? Cool. What this actually does is we don't run Python on our network devices as we know. So everything is built locally via Python. And then the engineer, as in this case, we build these through the roles and the modules and the playbooks. And it builds all of the configuration locally. And it executes this and using APIs pushes it to the network devices. Now you can use APIs, or more commonly you can use SSH. And one of the nice things about Ansible is you're not opening a whole new bunch of features because we have SSH to our devices anyway, right? So it makes it really, really easy to all of a sudden go from SSHing into the device from our single laptop to be running Ansible using SSH to do that for us. We don't have to open additional, any additional ports or access. So the security team are super happy with us. So let's look at our starting network topology here. I mentioned before about the guys being on the, in the data center site, and they're only there for the limited amount of time. And this is pretty much a simple topology that they might have gone, a data center team might have gone out there to build you. And so we have our core devices at the top, which are XE, our distribution devices, which are Nexus switches, and we have an access layer or end of rack switch, top of rack switch, which is in Nexus. The data center team has done a sterling job as always. They've cabled everything up. We've got all the perfect lights all running. They've logged in really quickly and give us management access to the devices. And so we can now jump onto those devices. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, there it is. I'm going to show you my uh, command line. Now I'm running this in, um, in the DevNet sandbox. Oops. There we go. So you can see all my devices. And this is all running in Viral using Viral Utils, which makes it a really nice tool to do some POC and to do some testing and work. Made bigger? Bigger for the guy at the back. Hold on. Good? Thank you. So you can see we have all of our devices here. They're all reachable. We can see our management addresses on there. And we can see the access, the core, and the distribution. I'm going to jump back to the slides in a sec. OK. So this is what it looks like now. And this is what I want it to look like momentarily. So I want my layer 3 links with, between my core and distribution using OSPF area 1. I want to configure my whole VPC domain. I want my layer 2 ports to be up with trunk access and port channels. I want my VLANs configured, and you can see my VLANs there. I've got uh, 100, 101, 102, 103 for the different groups within my organization. And I want HSRP and my SVIs distributed as well. So that's my, my end goal, and that's what I want to be. Let's hop back, oops, to the demo. OK. So I have skipped ahead just a little bit, just to put some base configurations in there. And now what I want to do is, I want to, let me just get to history. You can see that I've configured the access and I've configured the um, distribution already ahead of time. And I'm just using the limit command. Actually, what I want to do first is I want to actually show you the devices are blank. So I want to do viral SSH core uh, one. Oops. OK. OK. Haven't got OSPF running yet. I've got a couple of interfaces that are all up, but none of them are assigned.
My interfaces are all up as we see, but no descriptions. And then finally, I want to do a show IP route. And I've got no routes. I'm not getting anything. Although I'm connected to all my devices, I'm not receiving any routes. There's nothing in my routing table. So I'm going to jump out of that device, and I'm going to jump into device two. So show uh, run section. Oops. There we go. And we talked about removing fat fingered networking. Well, I've just proven that's what we can do. Show IP and brief. Show in description. Same on both devices. OK. So I want to configure these devices. So I run my Ansible playbook. And I limit this just to run on those two devices that I've shown you. OK. So the playbook kicks off. Let's go back to the slides. We can come back to this once it's continued. OK. How am I doing for time? OK. So here what we have is we saw the playbook is actually running. And you can have multiple plays within the playbook. And you can run the roles against the relevant groups. As I showed you, we can run it against the distribution or the access or the, or the core. And there's reasons why you'd like to do that. And then we have the Ansible roles. And these align to the actual network roles or the roles that they do within our network. We have our inventory file, which basically lists out all of our devices. And I can show you an inventory file real quick. Uh, where's Atom? There. Oh, it's on the edge. There. Oh, Atom's not coming up. Never mind. You can see that I've got a slide further down. You can see the uh, inventory file, which has the network devices. And we can logically group this for our configurations. And then we can have our variable files. Because switch 1 is not going to be identical to switch 2. There's going to be some differences between HSRP. And there'll be differences between IP addresses. And we can keep these down to uh, specific devices. Or we can keep it down to specific groups as well, which is super cool. Because if we have a group of routers who just doing all the same functionality, we can bunch them all into one group and put all that configuration out in bulk so all those devices are then the same. Oh, I need to be. Oops. There we go. OK. So here we'll just take a quick look at a playbook. And the playbook um, is the design for the workflow for the need to configure the network. We can link this to the inventory devices, to the groups, or the particular roles that we spoke, spoke about here. And here you'll see that we're configuration of the distribution switches. And the connection is local, which means we connect and build that file locally. We have our roles there, which we're familiar with, like Nexus, VLANs, and VPC, VPC trunks, L3 interfaces, HSRP, and OSPF. And then underneath that, we have the access switch as well. And we can execute this in the order of operations. Because as we know on Nexus devices, or some ne most network devices, if you try to configure something else before something started, you're going to get a syntax error. It's not going to allow you to configure that. So we have to. We can order this in an executable order, just like we would if we were configuring it ourselves. And here now we talk about the roles and how the roles are specific for the feature, and how these roles are now reusable, and we can reuse, reuse these, and how different groups will get different roles. And so if I have my core and my distribution area, we can define those differently for those roles and different groups which are going to get those. And then we spoke about the uh, inventory. And this is the one I wanted to show you in Atom here. You can see the IP addresses for the core and the distribution. And you don't have to use IP addresses. You could use um, uh, DNS, F, uh, fully qualified domain names there. And then we can put those into groups. You saw I had those as distribution and access. And we build those within the children files. And then we put the core devices in there. So by defining the two core devices there, we class them within the core section here. The Nexus devices, because there are two Nexus switches, I've actually put those in there as uh, distribution and access, because they're the same type of device. 
And then we move on to the uh, variable type of files here. And this is where we get sort of host specific and group details. So on all of my switches, I want those VLANs. But the difference that we mentioned before about IP addresses and HSRP information, some OSPF information like router ID, has to be specific for that individual device. And there's been a number of times where I've mistakenly misconfigured HSRP and put the wrong IP address in, in there. And we have the configuration details here, VLAN list, layer 3, router ID, etc. And now we can easily manage those network um, configurations in the variable files. For example, we might want to add another layer 3 interface in there. And we could easily go into here, add an interface, say Ethernet 1 slash 6, and we could put another IP address in there, 172.16.0.5. And then we would update that file quite quickly. And we can push that back out to the router, or switch in this case. But when we push it out to that device, that new change that we made, would that alter the entire state of the device? No, it wouldn't, because we're using an idempotent behavior. So as it runs through the playbook, Ansible will see that we already had that interface on 1 slash 5. The difference is we're adding now 1 slash 6 to the uh, new configuration file. We're just adding that. So nothing will change. The other great thing about the idempotent behavior is, and this happened to me a number of years ago, I came into the, uh, the office one morning and I was doing a change with one of my coworkers. Unfortunately, due to London traffic, he was late. So I sat down and I ran the change for him. Once the change had ran, I got up and I treated myself to a coffee. He came in behind me, sat down. He was scheduled to run this and he ran the same playbook. But because I'd already ran the playbook, nothing changed. So it ran through the playbook, and he saw that it had already been deployed. If we didn't have this behavior, we would be constantly changing the state of our devices frequently. Oh, I need to go up one. So I need to now see how our playbook has done. OK, cool. So we see here, we've got the play recap at the bottom. It's gone through changing absolutely everything that we needed to change. We changed the core one, core two. We skipped the distribution switches, and we skipped the access switches with the limit command. And we saw that we've just gone and changed the core devices. So we've changed these. We've had the devices with non-unreachable and non-fail, which is good. And so now I want to log back into those devices and run those same commands that I showed you before, just to see if anything has changed. So I did show run section OSPF. Our OSPF sections there. Oops. Show IP in brief. Great. All of our interfaces are now open. They've got IPs. Show int description. You still see that at the back, OK? Thank you. There we go. We've got descriptions on all of our interfaces. And now let's look at our routing table. Pretty cool, right? Let's see if the other device has done the same. OK, oops. Here we go. Uh, show run section. OSPF's good. Uh, Showing description. Descriptions are all there. Show IP in brief. Good. Oops. Full routing table. So we configured those devices quite simply, quite easily, without having to copy anything into the device. And I could have spent this time drinking more coffee. And I like that. OK. Oops. So
So that brings us on to our summary. I thought I had another slide there. Okay. So in the summary, what we saw was is how source control can actually benefit you. I'm just going to move to the next slide. How source control can benefit you and how version control can benefit you. By using commonality tools such as Ansible, Playbook, and Puppet and Chef, we can now configure our network, and we don't have to log into our devices anymore. We can log in as you saw for validation, but we can even go one step further and do the validation through automation. And this is something which is even super cooler. Because after a little while, it became apparent to me that I'm configuring my devices with this great automation, but I'm still doing the validation as what you saw. So now we've started doing validation again through automation to actually have the code run, log into our devices and check the desired states that we actually wanted for us. And so we went through that whole process. On the screen, I get asked a lot, can I do this myself? Yep, absolutely. The DevNet Sandbox is there at your disposable 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. You can reserve the sandboxes for up to seven days, and you can run in. You can clone the code from the uh, Cisco um, DevNet GitHub repo, log into there, download that code exactly like I run it, and run it yourself. You can update and play with the configuration files and the playbooks. And the good thing about it is it's not a production network. So if you break it, you break it. And that's how we learned some of the things today. We have two flavors of sandbox. We have the always on and the reserved. I am using the reserved sandbox today, but you can actually always use an always on sandbox. But please bear in mind, when using the always on sandbox, you are sharing it with another person. All of the code samples that you saw today in the Net DevOps demo right at the bottom there. If you want to stay in touch, here is all my details on the left hand side. Since this picture has been taken, I've been given a pay rise and do have a much bigger boat. And you can connect with everybody at DevNet on the usual channels there. All of the code, like I mentioned, is on the repo. The code for this demo is on my repo. And you can also pick it up on Cisco DevNet Code Exchange as well. If you have any questions, you're all invited to the uh, WebEx Teams room, where you can ask me questions, and I've been monitoring that one for 20 days. But if you wanted to reach out to me individually on the details above, that's not a problem. I would really appreciate some feedback on the session. The way that we make the sessions better is by your feedback, whether it's good, back, good feedback or bad feedback. Feedback is feedback. And I'd really encourage you to continue your education with the demos that we have today, the self-paced labs. We've got the Meet the Engineer sessions and all of the related sessions that come with it. And with that, guys and girls, this brings us to the end of the demo. I'll be up at the front of the stage taking any more questions. I hope this has been as much fun for you seeing it as it has been presenting it. Enjoy the DevNet Zone. Thank you.